General Dev, Mrs. Singh Roy, and uh, this extremely distinguished uh, uh, gathering audience. Thank you first, all of you, for being here. And uh, I think your presence, your eminence, is uh, itself evidence of the seriousness with which we would uh, we desire uh, as both as uh, uh, as an as a nation in particular and through our intellectual institutions to engage with uh, surely uh, the most difficult region in the world uh, it is easy to look away from uh, difficulty uh, but uh, as uh, as a nation which uh, uh, feels very much both historically as well as in the present context uh, that the part of the ebb and flow of the geopolitics of this region we know that it is uh, not merely uh, we know that we must engage uh, with our friends and brothers across a very, very, uh, very, very, uh, actually not too wide, a bit of water. First, uh, I must enter a caveat. Uh, and I'm sure that all of you, so most of you have experience in government, will certainly understand why I'm saying it. Uh, the caveat is some, sometimes, if not often, I shall slip into shorthand because the long hand in discussion may prove to be a little you know, undiplomatic. And I certainly do not want uh, to, uh, to say anything that might upset any of our equally valued guests here. Uh, that said, I shall try and be as uh, objective as I possibly can. And uh, one way towards objectivity is obviously to see events through the mirrors, mirrors of history. Point two, I'm delighted that uh, you are holding a conference on West Asia and not on the Middle East. In fact, uh, I think I was somewhere, I think I was in Bahrain or somewhere speaking, and there they had used, or somebody had used the term Middle East. I think it was the uh, chairman uh, from IISS. And I raised a point uh, that uh, when you call yourselves Middle East, uh, you have to answer a very basic question which is the East you are in the middle of? And the answer is that you are not really part of the Middle East. You are part of uh, a European stroke American definition of an imagined East. And uh, if you don't get your geography correct, you will certainly never get your geopolitics correct. Uh, you used a word, General decades while you introduce in your introductory remarks I think the very first thing we should do is to see decades as a very short term uh, we would perhaps be getting somewhere if we began a hundred years ago and if you really extend this perspective forward you'll have to go even further back because the past in this region is always with us. It doesn't go away. It shapes and reshapes itself. But for the purposes of uh, this morning's remarks, may I, uh, may I begin with the exactly a hundred years ago? A uh, hundred years ago, the war to war, to end all wars, ended. And it was followed closely by the peace to end all peace. The consequences of the war have been read in many ways, of World War I have been many ways. 
in one direct transition we all know the linkage between the first world war and the second world war as it affected europe it's uh, familiar less familiar is the fact that the second world war merged seamlessly into the third world war the third world war was a cold war and while the cold war may have remained uh, cool enough not to burn up europe again it was very very warm in many parts of the world including within our neighborhood southeast asia saw the cold war becoming dangerously dangerously hot uh, africa latin america and so on. and in fa in fact the politics of the cold war gripped west asia very very firmly and uh, turned it around in many many directions where did the, the cold war end the cold war didn't end in berlin the cold war ended in afghanistan and that is where in a sense the fourth world war began which is what we choose to call the war against terrorism uh, with all its expanded geography and new dimensions the interesting fact is that while uh, the second world war ended and third world war also ended for west asia the first world war has not ended and it still continues to keep its uh, to affect the region why has it not ended because what were the consequences of the first world war the concept the first consequence of the first world war was that it ended the age of empire the empires and kingdoms had basically ruled the geopolitics of the world ever since known history but over the previous 100 years or maybe a little longer if you want to include latin america and the rise of the bolivarist movement uh, which ended the spanish empire but after that if you see the chinese empire ended the indian empires ended the world war one saw the collapse of the tsarist empire which in fact was much huger than we ever imagined it ended the uh, austro-hungarian empire and the end of the austro-hungarian empire and the ottoman empire left behind a space for turbulence which still has not settled still has not settled and the age of empire was replaced by the last phase of the age of colonization in terms the second consequence which was a, a logically related consequence was to find an answer to the question what would replace empires and from here emerged the idea of a nation state not the nation state as determined by the armies of dynasties or by the armies of kings but nation states broadly which were phased out or which were created through Uh, uh, through an idea that was beginning to find itself which is through the will of the people and the will of the people became the determinant which is uh, definitely a very important projection of the uh, of uh, the american ideas that came into being for europe and for the rest of the world but in west asia in west asia there was no direct transfer by and large from the age of empire into the age of the nation state it was interrupted by forms of neo colonization which the region itself recognized the people themselves recognized early so you got forms of quasi freedom one of the major consequences of the first world war for the region was that because they needed the help the, the very, very let's take at least as far as west asia is concerned uh, what the uh, world war 1 meant first the british primarily churchill thought that he could conquer the whole of west asia through by seizing the top what do i mean by seizing the top by seizing the khal the caliphate itself by defeating turkey and once you had defeated turkey all the dominions of turkey would naturally form into part of the british but the failure of gallipoli ended that project 
you know, purely theoretically, somebody should try and understand what the success of the British in Gallipoli might have meant. And what would, it would be interesting theoretical exercise, if nothing else. The second, uh, the British did not actually uh, try and seize uh, the, the caliphate only through Gallipoli. They also sent an army from India. And this army from India is not very advertised because it ended up in the most crushing defeat that the British had ever seen, one of the worst defeats they had witnessed uh, in history. And this defeat, when they moved an Indian army with British officers from Basra and up the Tigris, up the Tigris. This too was defeated by the Turks. Uh, and indeed, there were lots of Arabs in the Turkish army at that, by that time. So the British project to seize West Asia from the top failed. Why was West Asia so crucial? Because one of the reasons for the start of the uh, World War I was the fact that the German Navy had quickly, through the use of new technology, changed from largely coal-fired ships to oil-fired ships. So energy, which had been discovered in uh, Masjid Suleiman, in uh, in the late uh, 19th century that was uh, Iran had now expanded and the discovery of energy was very critical to the retention of power and therefore Churchill who was in charge of the Admiralty needed both Anglo-Dutch petroleum as well as the oil fields they were a part of uh, his strategic requirements. But when that failed, the British then got, sought and got help from both the Jewish communities as well as the Arab communities in the fight against the uh, Ottoman Caliphate. And this led to the first, well, conflict paradox of World War I whose consequences we still did today because having got support from both they had got support in return for promises and the promises were inherently con contrary because Palestine could not be given legally or uh, you know uh, strategically to both and therefore the partition of Palestine with the consequences that we all know was the seeds of it lay in the British help that it got from uh, both communities. The se second consequence was that because of the pressures that emerged after World War I, people forget that while Gandhiji in our country was leading the challenge against colonization, at exactly the same time, a great intifada broke out in Iraq. Again, the memory and history of that intifada has been buried. I find it uh, one of the real things which, please pardon me for saying this, one of the real things which irritate me, anger me, is the fact that we refuse to discover our own histories. We are embarrassed by them. Why? Why, does, why do people in Iraq don't know about this Intifada, which occupied two years, which was the first great uprising of the Arab world, which was eventually quashed by the British through the use of the Royal Air Force and through the use of gas on a mass scale. We have at least chosen uh, to uh, protect and preserve our history and the weapons of colonization which were primarily economic in our case and the creation of famine as one of the fundamental elements of the colonization project. So at that time the uprising took place because strategic interests and energy was involved the British were absolutely reluctant to hand over power to the Arab regions and instead resorted as I said before to quasi-colonialism which was an exchange system which we saw in the British relationship with the princely states that an exchange of security guarantees 
you guarantee our strategic security, that is the British security, while the British would guarantee the security and survival of the governments they had put in place. And therefore, it, it literally, please, uh, I, please, I hope I, I don't want to uh, upset anything by my phrases, pardon me, but eventually what became is that uh, uh, the whole of the Arab world, not the whole of it, large parts of it were uh, turned, you know, in, in certain nations into family dominions. The consequences of that are still run through still run through events and focus and create history creates events reality creates a set of events the third consequence was the rise of a new idea the idea of sovereignty and sovereignty as exercised by the nation state. And you can see how much in 100 years the idea of sovereignty has changed because in uh, 1919 it is estimated that if there were about 55 what may be called political spaces, you know, with uh, definitions. Today the United Nations has nearly 200. And uh, as, uh, and the, the, you know, uh, as we progress, you know, the the fluctuations that are inherent in this uh, in this transition have still not perhaps collapsed but another consequence that left a deep impact on this region lead deep impact on this region uh, because it was a region which is largely muslim not completely it is uh, you know, uh, completely erroneous to believe that this region was completely, it was not completely Muslim. And just to go into an aside, I must say that, you know, when, for example, we read about how the brutality with which the Yazidi Christians, or the Yazidis, they're not Christians, the Yazidis had been treated in the Iraq uh, by the rise of Daesh and by the ISIS, I did point out that remember that this fact that Yazidi still exists means that for 1400 years Muslim kingdoms have lived peacefully with them. That, true, that too is a fact. And it is only the rise of a what might be called uh, 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 even might be called an anti-Islamic terrorist groups that have created this barbarism. All the sultans and khalifas, khalifas out there, after all, were Muslims too. And they lived according to the tenets of uh, the people of the faith, which is there very much in the holy book. But one of the immediate consequences, as we all know, was the collapse of the idea of the khalif. Khalifa, uh, sorry, the collapse of the institution of the Khalifa. But the collapse of the institution was not the same as the collapse of an idea. The idea was buried deep into the consciousness, waiting for a moment to revive at some point. And this idea would revive and could revive only if the alternative forms of governance proved to be inadequate to the aspirations of the people. And of course, if you have discontent, and discontent is nurtured by outside forces, by powerful outside forces, particularly when it comes to the rise of Daesh, I mean, that story is still waiting to be written. That story is truly waiting to be written, and it will be written, I hope, in some of your countries, which have experienced the impact. Why the large truck convoys were allowed to travel from one point to the other, who and what and how, uh, you will not uh, be able to solve these problems until you address the truth. <laughs>
that lies behind. But broadly speaking, World War I created huge displacement. And this displacement was, there was no adequate replacement. And the inadequacy of the replacement led to a lot of, uh, to push uh, language into strange corners, a lot of misplacement. And the contradictions today haunt us. The parallel story of Iran has a different narrative. Iran in World War I was basically divided, as you know, into Russian and British occupation zones. Uh, Iran was very neatly uh, divided between Russia and uh, the uh, and Britain uh, and after World War I the uh, the rise of the Pehlvis the story is well known um, but the important point of Iran which is the rise of Iran as a Shia state now that is a story which also uh, has uh, I mean, there's, uh, there's very little, uh, I mean, there's a lot of ignorance about it. So often, the, the Iran as a Shia state is only a 500-year phenomenon. It's a, it, it's a phenomenon that uh, comes in with uh, the arrival of the Azerbaijanis, I think, into. But for me, my understanding of the rise of Shiism in uh, Iran has as much to do with Shiism as it has to do with Iranian nationalism. And Iranian nationalism had been broken or splintered uh, first with the Arab conquests and then with the Mongol conquests. The Mongol conquests devastated Iran in a way which really is uh, it's heartbreaking in terms of how its peasantry and the rise of famines was totally devastated. And the return of Iranian unity uh, in the 16th century under the uh, particularly Shah Abbas and so on was a very fundamental fact. Of. And today the strength of Iranian Shiism I think is because it represents the reunification of Iran and its strength. And Iran then has always going to be seeking what I find interesting personally is that historically, and this is now goes back to the kings Darius and so on, historically Iran has never really looked east, although it has been in a position to cross the Indus many times and very quite often you know, on at least two or three occasions it did cross the Indus. Its strategic targets for reasons which I am sure uh, will be explained to me over a cup of coffee, have always been the Mediterranean. That was this conflict with Greece. And even today, its presence, it seeks a presence on the Mediterranean. Uh, the analysis of Hezbollah will go on and on and on. But Hezbollah is a fortress as much on the Mediterranean as it is vis-a-vis -vis Israel. So, uh, Iran's own dynamics had to take it to a certain point, but to cut a, a very, very long story short, the critical year in our understanding of the present conflict, where history takes another major curve, a bend, and stretches out in all sorts of unforeseen directions, is 1979. Because 1979 saw the Iranian revolution of uh, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, we have a slight misconception that the uh, regional conflict that we see today, uh, Iran, Saudis and so on, is a 21st century phenomenon. It began in 1980. It began in 1980. I mean, Saddam Hussein was the first response 
to the rise of uh, the Iranian Revolution and the Shia Revolution, an eight-year war which ended really, I mean, Henry Kissinger, much to his own uh, surprise, is not always right, but in this case, <laughs> he certainly was when he uh, said uh, about the Iran-Iraq war, he said, they hope both lose. And uh, that eight-year war was turned out to be a war in futility, but it drained the resources of the region to an extraordinary degree. On this side, the rise of what is described as Shia radicalism invited a response of Sunni radicalization, which was uh, mentored in uh, very many ways all of which, since you know it all, I shall not dwell on it even for half a minute. And uh, it has consequences, it has consequences uh, for the region. In 79 also, something happened which ex suddenly and explosively expanded the geography of this war, of this conflict reason, and that was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the same year. And the Soviet invasion then gave legitimacy to radicalization because the superpowers were queuing up to get photographed between people they were soon to consider an enemy. But uh, the use of certain forces, uh, you know, whenever superpowers indulge in it, they tend to forget that the people you think you are using may in turn be using you on small geographies, large geographies. This story is very often repeated. Those who have played with fire don't fully understand that fire is also playing with you. We have watched it in our country. We have watched in our country and the dangerous, dangerous politics and the consequences we had to face in the 80s by stoking radical fires. The story from 79 to is probably part of your career graph of many of all those who are seated here. And uh, we have seen its consequences. I will just like to end on, uh, on uh, to speak a little bit about uh, one, what we see, what I perceive as the true dangers of uh, or Islamist terrorism or terrorism which is faith-based terrorism. And what is uh, our country's understanding and policy towards West Asia. And the two are not necessarily linked. I just want to end on, the, on these two aspects of the subject. What precisely is the danger from terrorism? If terrorism was only a law and order problem, we would not, we would recognize it as a serious danger, but we would not recognize it as an existential danger. The real danger that comes is from the ideology of terrorism. And the ideology of terrorism is dangerous too, because again, from a hundred years ago, the process that began of nation states, the nation state today has become the building block of the architecture of stability, right? And wherever you see this nation state tottering, you will see that instability begins to infect that region in dramatic ways. The arguments about borders exist in everywhere there is a border. But uh, common sense suggests that sometimes you have to accept de facto, hope to make de facto into du jure, and then carry on. And carry on in a direction where you can guarantee and ensure the primary challenge of the 21st century, which is the prosperity of the people. 
for me the 21st century is going to be marked by the second question I, I since India was the first nation to emerge from uh, European colonization and please uh, I hope you will note that uh, when Gandhi started his movement again exactly a hundred years ago the even Indians used to scoff at him and say that uh, what does this man in a dhoti think he is doing the British Empire will last for 400 years after all it is the most powerful empire in history once Gandhi began it could not last even for 30 years and why didn't it last for 30 years? Because Gandhi answered the answer to a question which had puzzled the world. How do you defeat European colonization? Nobody had the armies for it. Nobody had the means for it. Gandhi defeated it very uniquely through the strength of an Indian idea, which was the power of Satyagraha, the power of not simply non-violence, but the power of truth and justice that we shall not accept injustice. And that truly is the prevailing sentiment if you go among the people across the world. And once he awakened the power of the Indian masses, which had been dormant for heaven knows how long, European colonization really began in India. And European colonization died in India because once 1947 happened, Nowhere, the whole colonial project across the world collapsed in another 30 years. I think by 1970, 71, the last colonies were over. I didn't mean new colonization was over, but certainly the last colonies were over. The question that is before us in the 21st century is different from the question of the 20th century. The, the central question of the 20th century is how do we get freedom? The central question of the 21st century was for me asked on 16th August 1947. 15th August we got freedom. This is the question of 16th August. What shall we do with freedom? Do we know what to do with freedom? Have we got freedom from the British in order to deny freedom to our own people? Have we got freedom from colonial powers in order to keep them in the kind of poverty which colonialism infect, inflicted upon us? And if you think that colonialism was not an economic deprivation project, then I will just leave you with two statistics. And these statistics are there, I think, uh, uh, anyone can go to Yale and still uh, meet uh, the author is the rise and fall of nations uh, there the state is very clear in 19 in 1750 1750 is seven years from the ep from the significant battle which is the battle of uh, Polashi which uh, Sirajuddullah lost to the British and from there emerged the first province of the British which is Bengal and from there they moved on like all good colonials they made Indians pay for their, for their own defeat and uh, in 1750 India had 24 percent of world manufacturing output China had 30 percent between India and China we had 50 percent of world manufacturing output Britain had 2 percent Russia had 3% or something, France had 4 something like that. America didn't quite exist in, in the sense we know it. But, uh, and by 1947, the figures were totally reversed. India had only 2% and Britain had 24%. This has neat a statistical turnaround uh, to describe reality as you can get. So, have we got freedom in order to continue that impoverishment, to continue the poverty? And the answer is clearly no. There is another 70 years after or 50 years after in some cases, right? The alibis have gone. We can't go around. I can't go around blaming the British. In any case, the British didn't come to my country for my welfare. They came to my country for their welfare. And I can't keep on blaming the British. Nobody can keep on blaming their old colonial past. 
we have had our country for a generation and more. If we can't find the solutions, right, we must never forget that we were conquered not because Britain was France or France was strong. We were conquered because we were weak. And unless we find the answers now to our weakness, we can certainly claim to be free, but are we com going to be able to claim that we are independent? That's the question. So, the central question before us is really how do we are able to manage ourselves? The nation state is the formation that we have. Terrorism doesn't believe in the nation state. It believes in faith-based space. And faith-based space is quite another construct. And therefore, the power of the idea of the caliphate as a kind of receptic receptacle of unity, and it's an imagined reality. In an essay that I wrote some time back, I called it the romance of regression. That you create artificial realities. But the power of artificial reality can have very real impact on our lives. And we have to understand that we have to win the battle, not merely on the battlefield. We also have to win the battle in the mind. And if we don't win the battle on the mind, all our efforts to maintain security are keep on, will keep on tripping over themselves. The second parallel but related serious danger from terrorism is that it cannot, that it seeks to poison plural society. Because pluralism is anathema. At one level, it is a conflict between those who believe in faith equality and faith supremacy or faith unilateralism. And if we are going to enter the century without believing that the human being and freedom is a fundamental right, right? And freedom includes not simply the freedom of voice, it includes freedom of faith. Without freedom of faith and equality of faith, I am very happy to tell all this distinguished guests that in, I live in a country where every morning begins with the asan. I think you are here. I would suggest that all of you, uh, one morning, get up before dawn and go to the old uh, city. And in the space of half an hour or 45 minutes, you will hear this morning being woken up by the asan, followed closely by the temples of the Hanuman Mandir, followed closely by the recitation of the Guru Granth Sahib from the Gurdwara and followed on Sundays by the peal of church bells, all within the same area. And since, of course, we are Indians, we do not believe in silent secularism. We believe in very loud secularism. <laughs> so everything is on a microphone. You can't miss it. So faith and this nations across, I know I can see that change and reform is coming in. It's coming in at a pace in West Asia, which perhaps 10 years ago could not be predicted. But it is wonderful to see that nations and regions there recognizing the need that yes, we need pluralism. We need the value systems of freedom and equality. And they will come in graded forms. They will come some, some generation will pay the price, but at least this, another one will gain the benefits. Our own policy is truly to encourage and be with all systems that, that, that believe in values of this kind. And so we are able to work very happily across binaries. I uh, reveal no secrets, when, but I'll just tell you the calendar of uh, our Prime Minister's diplomatic uh, engagement from <laughs> January to March, let us say. Uh, in January began with a visit by the Prime Minister of Israel, 
which was a very successful visit, followed immediately by the Prime Minister going to Davos to inaugurate Davos, followed after that by the unique arrival of 10 heads of government from ASEAN countries, <coughs> followed immediately after that by a hugely successful visit to Palestine. And he went to Palestine uh, and got the highest civilian honor in Palestine. And how did he reach Palestine? He reached Palestine on the helicopter provided by His Majesty King of Jordan. And from there, he comes to UAE to open an international conference on governance, recognizing his preeminent place in governance, after which he goes to Oman. In between, our country is the chief uh, guest at uh, Saudi's uh, festival for this year. After which, when he comes back, we greet Iran's foreign minister here for a wonderful two-day visit. After which, President Macron comes for the International Solar Alliance. After which, the King of Jordan comes. So over and over again, we are able to work across regional or even international binaries. Our relations with Russia are very good. This week, we will be having a 2 plus 2 with America. Our relations with China are very mature because they are built on the, they are built on the philosophy that uh, differences must not be allowed to become disputes and disputes should not be allowed to grow into conflict. We have, a, we have border differences with China, but not a single bullet has been fired across the border for nearly 50 years. That, I think, is mature management of differences and relations. And one of the reasons I think while, why we have the credibility to do so is because we have no aggressive intent. We have no policy of aggressive intent or interference. We try and keep the bilateral relationship as positive and as healthy as we possibly can. We try and if at all required, first we don't get into regional disputes. And number two, we try if in, in a multilateral context, if possible, to be healthy. Our solar alliance, our, uh, interven our interventions with Africa, for example, are all economic and all people-centric. The projects that we do deal with water, deal with, uh, uh, with transport, deal with helping the lives of people, deal with solar, get electricity. And we invest a huge amount of our diplomatic capacity and capabilities into these projects. As I say, in, uh, in a parallel context, that uh, when we in India say that uh, we have a defense force, we actually mean it. <laughs> in other words, we don't have an offense force. On the other hand, we understand the meaning of defense. That so not a single inch of land shall be ceded and not a single Indian shall be affected without accountability. And it is the fact that we concentrate on defense is what makes our defense forces uh, so, uh, I think, powerful. At the conflicts of the region, to come back, is something that we really wish as India, you know, would come towards resolution. And would come towards resolution not by the efforts of X power or Y power, but come through a resolution by an understanding reached by the nations themselves.
just as you cannot outsource security you cannot outsource peace also you have to find the ways and means towards uh, peace by themselves and if this peace comes then this region which we think of as a region of so much conflict has the potential has the visible visible wealth to become the most prosperous region in the world every time eid comes every time christmas comes every time diwali comes we send cards wishing all we love peace and prosperity there is a reason because there is no prosperity without peace maybe it is a job of economic policy wallas to bring prosperity our job is to get peace and i think that is probably as useful a theme for this conference as any thank you very much